Okay, first of all, I'm Jennifer Widom. I'm the Dean of Engineering. I've uh, held that position for about six months now, um, and it's always a delight to have events like this. Um, this is the first event in a series that we're calling the Stanford Engineering Summer School. Uh, for most of you, summer ended on Monday, I think, with Labor Day. But for us at Stanford, summer actually extends to the end of September, which is when we begin classes. So we're still deep in summer here. Um, next summer, I'm told there are going to be three events uh, in the three months of summer in this series. So one of the highlights for me as dean is to work with brilliant teachers and researchers. And one of them is here tonight, a special colleague, uh, who I will introduce shortly, who is going to help us uh, learn about the decision-making process. So we're all going to learn, leave tonight with um, better tools, better frameworks in order to make decisions. Should we trust our gut or should we be rational? Um, so apparently, for example, I did not know this, but I'm told somebody recently won $700 million in a lottery. That's a nice sum of money. And we're going to learn whether we should be going out and buying lottery tickets, for example. Um, so uh, I've, told, I've been told this is going to be a very entertaining and informative evening. Uh, we're also being broadcast on Facebook Live. Probably thousands of people around the world are watching together with us. So it is my pleasure to introduce Mehran Sahami. Many of you have probably heard about Mehran, even if you haven't met him. Uh, Mehran arrived at Stanford by my calculation five years before I did. Um, but, and I've been here a long time, but he arrived as an undergraduate student. I actually arrived as a faculty member. So he is an alum, bachelor's, master's, and PhD, all at Stanford. Uh, his thesis was in the area of artificial intelligence, which was a hot area at the time, but is a much hotter one now, as you all know. He is a professor of computer science. He is the Robert and Ruth Halperin University Fellow in undergraduate education. Before joining the faculty between his PhD and becoming a faculty member, he was a senior research scientist at Google. Mehran teaches what is arguably the most famous class, most popular class at Stanford, CS106A. How many of you have heard of CS106A? Yep. How many of you have taken CS106A? How many from Mehran? All right, so you're very familiar with. Well, one interesting thing I like to tell people about CS106A is that we have maybe 1,700 uh, incoming freshmen every year. We teach CS106A to about 1,800 students a year. So more than the freshman class. Uh, that's because graduate students take it as well. But about 90% of our undergraduates take that amazing class. Mehran teaches other classes as well. He is an award-winning professor, uh, one, perhaps one of the most recognizable faculty across campus. I think when you hear him talk, uh, you will understand why. So without further ado, Mira. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Jennifer, for that overly generous introduction. It's all downhill from here. There's no way I can match that. So just want to make sure expectation setting is, is all set. Um, and thank you very much for taking the time to come down this evening so we could talk a little bit together about uh, decision making. So what I hope to do tonight is to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, some decision making processes and some of the mathematics that might underlie that. Um, we'll actually go through some examples. Decision making is not a spectator sport. So some cases where we'll actually go through and we'll ask you to make some decisions and maybe get a little audience participation. Um, and hopefully, this is just scratching the surface in terms of this very rich field that exists. But hopefully, you can come away with something from, from this event. So I want to spend a little bit of time just with some preliminaries where we think about when we're making decisions, thinking about making decisions under uncertainty. And that being the notion that when we're going to make some decision, we don't know what's going to happen as a result. If we knew what was going to happen as a result, then it becomes very very easy in some sense, for some definition of easy, to make that decision because we don't know or we, we don't have
have any uncertainty about what are the possible consequences of that happening. And so many of the decisions we make involve uncertainty. And if we recognize that fact, then the question is, how can we harness that to think about how being able to quantify that information in some way can help us make better decisions? And so the mathematical tool we're going to use is probability theory. I'm not going to assume any previous background in probability. Or if you had a bad experience with probability, hopefully that won't color your sense of this too much. But we'll talk a little bit about just some, some preliminaries to give us the, the groundwork for it. Um, and thinking of it really as a tool to formally quantify what's unknown. And then once we can do that, we can allow us to think about uncertainty about events in the future and then be able to reason about it in some slightly more formal way. And really the foundations for a lot of this, I'm happy to say, is this work of decision analysis, which was actually a field created and a term coined by Ron Howard, who's sitting right there. Um, so you actually get the master. And one of the things I have to say, Jennifer mentioned I was a student here. When I was a student, I got to be a disciple at the feet of Ron. So some of the things I'm actually going to do tonight, I have to be honest, are just stolen completely from Ron. Um, so thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. And it makes me a little nervous, actually. Um, <laughs> But the idea behind decision analysis is to think of a normative framework for decision making. And so what does that mean to think of a normative framework? So we can think of, of the notion of descriptive versus normative frameworks. A descriptive framework describes how people actually do make decisions. Right? A lot of psychologists worry about that. What do actually people do when confronted with these kind of decision problems? Normative, in some sense, argues for how a theory of how people should make decisions. Right? Not necessarily how they do, but what would be a framework that we could think of under particular assumptions, because everything in math is under particular assumptions, would be a reasonable way to make decisions that we could think of as being rational in some sense. And so the general principle we're going to talk about is this principle of maximizing expected utility. And to know what that actually means, that means at some point we're going to need to talk about what utility is. And it's not like Waterworks and Electric Company, if you remember those, different notion of utility. What and we think of when we think of expected, and we're going to get a little bit of statistics there, and hopefully, again, that was not a troubling experience, hopefully, in the past. And then maximize the term we can sort of be happy with. But the other thing to also keep in mind is that not all decisions are appropriate for formal analysis. So there are some decisions that make sense to think about having this framework and applying this kind of quantitative reasoning to make decisions. There are other decisions, like who should you marry? That is probably, I mean, you could if you wanted to, but that would be a little bit weird, but maybe under the right circumstances. Um, but probably not a decision you want to do formal analysis. Like, oh, you know, I really love him, but I'm not sure what's the probability he'll have hair in 20 years. How important is that to me? <laughs> right? There's other things we want to think about. So now is the time when we think about you know, putting on the ball gowns or the tuxedos and formalizing. Because one of the things we need to do in formalizing this is we need to define some particular uh, terms. And really what that boils down into is taking some simple concepts and making them look more complicated by giving them highfalutin terms. Okay, so that's one of it's you know classic mathematics trick. So first thing we're going to have is the sample space. And what is a sample space? If you look in a book on probability as to what a sample space is, it would you're all engineers, so this should all make sense, right? It's S. What is S? It's a set of all possible outcomes of an experiment. Okay, what is an experiment, right? That's why I get worried and think of the white lab coat and the Erlenmeyer flask. No, this is an experiment. Okay. Didn't mean for it to go under your feet. Now it becomes a slightly more personal experiment. <laughs> Thank you. But the idea is it's something for which we don't know what the outcome is until we do it. Okay? So that's the notion of experiment. Something happens. We don't want to know what the outcome is. After the experiment's performed, we can observe the outcome. And so if we think of the set of all possible outcomes of the experiment, that's just this thing called the sample space. So if we think about flipping a coin, so I brought my giant coins with me. If we flip a coin, we can think about what are the possibilities. There's heads and there's tails. And this is not real gold, just for the record. There's only two possibilities in the sample space. If we flip it, it will not land on its side. Not even withstanding that Twilight episode, Twilight Zone episode where it lands on its side and then that guy can read minds. Anyone remember that? There's a few people who are like, what is he talking about? And then there's a few other people who are like, yeah, now when he says it, it sounds absurd. We're not talking about that. So there's heads and tails as two possibilities. 
The other possible thing I can think about is, say, flipping two coins. So if I flip two coins, I want to keep these coins distinct, right? I have my gold coin, my silver coin, not real gold or silver. If I flip these two things, the sample space, the possibilities are now pairs of outcomes. So I could get heads on both coins. I can get heads on one coin and tails on another coin, which is different than getting heads on this coin and tails on this coin. Those are distinct outcomes that we would think about because we think of the coins as being distinct when we're just, say, we're flipping two coins without, say, just counting heads or tails. And then the possibility to get tails tails. If I roll a six-sided die, there are six possibilities for the outcomes. Not a lot of excitement there. Again, I can't land on a side. I can't land on a corner. If I, say, roll two dice and you consider the sum of these two dice, now I'm considering the sum. I'm not treating the dice as necessarily being diff different. I'm just saying roll the two dice and add them together so my possibilities become the integers from 2 to 12. Okay. I can also think of, well, now that I've defined sample space, I need to define some other term called an event, an event which we'll call E, because we always like to use the first letter of the word for our set. E is just some subset of S. And if you're a notation person, that looks like the notation. If you're not a notation person, just block that from your mind. All it really means is what is the thing you care about happening as a result of the experiment? Okay? So if I care about flipping heads on a coin, the event space that I care about is just heads, which is a subset of all possibilities, heads and tails. If I flip two coins and I say I care about getting at least one head, it's all the pairs that have at least one head. And so you can just kind of carry that through. What's the uh, thing of rolling an odd number when on one die? If there's nothing else you get from tonight, it's the fact that die is the singular form of dice. Okay? <laughs> so at least, hopefully there's some new information in this talk. And if I care about rolling an odd number, it's numbers one, three, and five. I care about rolling greater than eight on two dice. Again, it's pretty straightforward. Okay? So I can think of this notion of the sample space, which are all the possibilities, and then the event space, which is some subset of the things I care about. Okay? So with that happening, there is also this notion that we can think of as we begin to build up the layers of probability of a notion of equally likely outcomes. What does that mean? Well, there are certain sample spaces that have equal likelihood for all the possibilities. So if I consider a coin that's guaranteed to be fair, right, that means 50-50 chance of coming up each side, then the possibilities, heads and tails, are equally likely. Similarly, if I flip two coins and they're both fair, then those four possibilities of the head, 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 tail, tail, head, or tail, tail, are all equally likely. Each have a 25% chance because the probabilities have to sum up to one if I consider all the possibilities. Rolling a six-sided die again, if it's fair, all six possibilities are equally likely. And so if we now think about probability, so we introduce a little bit of notation, the probability, which is our capital P of each outcome, is just one over the number of outcomes if all the outcomes are equally likely. Right? Chance of rolling a three on a fair six-sided die is just one over six because there are six possibilities. Unless, of course, you play Dungeons and Dragons and then we have the 20-sided <laughs> die, but we'll talk about that later. Okay. In the more general case, if we think about an event, right, an event can have more than one outcome associated with it, like, say, rolling an odd number on one die. We just count up the number of outcomes that are in the event space, the outcomes essentially that satisfy some condition we care about, divided by the total number of outcomes, and that gives us the probability of that particular event. Okay, so now we can think about events as not just being one outcome, but again, it's some set of things happening. So probability of flipping heads on a fair coin is one half. Probability of rolling a five or six on a fair die is two out of six, because there's two possible outcomes out of six. So we just get one third as the probability. Okay, so any questions about that? And if there are any questions along the way, just feel free to raise your hand or shout it out, because it's better to just ask along the way if questions come up rather than waiting until the end. Especially if that question you wanted to ask was something that affected everything in the middle. Okay? So let's do a classic statistics problem. This is one of those problems that like statisticians just, you know, they feel like you can't take a statistics class without them telling you this because it's so important to understand people's birthdays. And I have to be honest, there's way more people here than I expected. So we're going to try this and see how well this works. Okay, so we can ask what's the probability that if we have n people in a room, so you are now n people, okay, none share the same birthday regardless of year. Now, in this room, we might actually have more than 365 people, which might make this impossible, but we'll see, because I think they tell me the capacity of the room is 320, so it's going to be close. Anyone, by the way, born February 29th? No one, interestingly enough, because there's actually a little story there. Uh, 
my son was almost, well, he was born in February, but when they were planning the, uh, the you know, day that he might be born or when they might uh, actually induce labor if they needed to do that, the doctor said, you know, there's a chance he could be born on February 29th. Do you know what the probability of that is? And I jumped up and said, yes, and I wanted to have a conversation. <laughs> And then my wife looked at me like, Maron, that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> and the doctor just walked out of the room, no joke. But then later on, one of the nurses came in, I guess because the doctor was like, we don't want to talk to this guy anymore. Um, one of the nurses came in and said, well, if he's born on February 29th, we'll actually let you choose the 20, February 28th or March 1st as the birthday, which is why it's, you don't actually see that actual birthday show up for a lot of people. Okay? Well, we can ask this question as a probability question. If we have n people in a room, what is the probability that no two people share the same birthday regardless of year? Okay? And so if we want to think about this using our sample space and our event space that we just kind of set up, we could think of what are all the ways that we could assign birthdays to n people, right? What's the sample space? What's the all possibilities? Well, each one of the n people can have one of 365 days of the year because you could have been born on any day. So if we consider all possibilities for those n people's birthdays, it's 365 to the nth power, okay? So then we need to consider what is the subset that satisfies the condition we care about. The condition we care about being that no one shares the same birthday. We still have n people in the room. So first person could have been born on any one of 365 days, but then the next person has to be born on one of 364 days because they can't be born on the same birthday as the first person. Next person has 365, 363 choices, 362, etc. So we get this product where the terms in the product are just going down by one each time. Okay, and if we have n people, we'll get down to 365 minus n plus 1. So let's do a little experiment. The experiment we're going to do is I'm going to call out a month of the year. Everyone who was born in that month of the year, raise your hand. And then I'll just call on people and you yell out the day in that month you were born. And if someone else had the same day, yell match. Okay? So we'll start with January. All the January birthdays. Hands up. Date. Oh, we got, all right, there we go. Thank you for matching. You can discuss afterwards. So that happened really quickly. It turns out we didn't need near as many people as we have in this room, right? So if we think about probability of no matching birthdays, we just took our event space size divided by our sample space size. That was the probability. And we could ask questions about that probability like, what are some interesting values then? Well, it turns out if you have 23 people in a room, which is far fewer than this, the probability of no matching birthdays is less than 50%. Okay? And that's the smallest such n for which that's true. So any more than 23 people in a room, you have a greater than 50% chance of no matching birthdays. Right? And people think, but, but that's strange. right? I would expect I need 180 people to cover half the calendar. No, you don't. Why don't you? Because for every new person who comes into the room, they get compared to every other person in the room. And then the next person comes in, they get compared to every other person in the room. So you get this quadratic increase in the number of comparisons you do. So very few people are needed to actually get to that 50% threshold. If we had 50 people, the probability of no matching birthdays is less than 3%. If we got up to 61, at that point, we're half a percent of that happening. So I show this in, in class to my students sometimes, and you know, this becomes like a size of a dorm at Stanford, and then they realize, hey, there's this real enough neat game I can play to win money in my dorm. And I say, no, don't gamble. Um, <laughs> and then right after that, we talk about the probability of different poker hands. But that's not important right now. 80 people were already down to less than a 1 in 100th percent chance. Right? So with this many people, I mean, it's, it's great that it happened on the very first try. There was virtually no chance it was not going to happen. Okay? And so that's what we need to think about is sometimes the probabilities for things don't work out the way we intuitively might think of them, but when we begin to get into sort of the combinatorial analysis of it, things are a little bit different. But the other factor that comes up is subtly changing what looks like the outward appearance of the problem can actually make the dynamic totally different. So let's consider just a slight variance of this problem. If there's n people in a room, what's the probability those n people don't share the same birthday as you? Okay? So that's what looks like a cosmetic change in the problem. Okay? So now you can be, all be the end people, I'll be the one person we'll compare birthdays to. And we're going to see how the probabilities kind of work out in this case.
So the number of ways to have n birthdays in the room for n people is still 365 to the nth power. That's the same sample space as before to so assign all the birthdays. The number of ways to have n birthdays that are different than yours, in that case mine, is all the n people can pick any day except my birthday for their birthday. And then we would satisfy the criteria that no one has the same birthday as me. So the denominator is going to be the same in our probability that no one has the same birthday as me. The only thing that changes now is the numerator has this slight change where before we had n terms in the numerator, they were just going down by one each time. Now they're not going down by one each time. They're just 364 to the nth power. Okay, so still n terms, but just slight variation of the problem. What does that mean in terms of the dynamics? Well, let's see. 23 was the number of people we needed before to get the probability of no matching birthdays 50%. If I have 23 people now, the probability of none of them matching my birthday is almost 94%. So completely different dynamic. If we get up to 100 people, probability of no one matching my birthday is 76%. We get up to 253 people, that's where the probability of no matching birthdays is 50%. And people also look at that and they say, but I would have expected 180. Right, or 182 or 183, right, about half the calendar. Why is it not half the calendar? Why is it higher? Why is it 253? Because you can have the same birthdays as each other, and that doesn't impact you having the same birthday as me. So in order to cover about half the calendar in expectation, we actually expect to have about 253 people. So let's actually try this out. Okay, so why are these probabilities so much higher than before? Because every time someone walks into a room, they don't get compared to everyone else in the room, they just get compared to me. So every new person that comes in is only one comparison rather than a quadratic number of comparisons. So anyone here born May 10th? We got one. Anyone else? You got two. All right, my birthday is May 10th. So in this room, we, we actually like, oh, we didn't break probability because there was actually a reasonable chance it would happen. But just because you share the same birthday as me, I think that's a wonderful thing. <laughs> so I'm going to give you birthday presents. <laughs> so thanks for coming. These are green slips of paper with portraits of Andrew Jackson. But it's so rare that I find people with the same birthday as me. Thanks. <laughs> Oh, yeah, everyone else is like, no. <laughs> but it was after midnight on the 9th, Maron. I know, I know. It's because I've, I've, in the classes I teach, they have fewer than this many people. Well, when they're actually, the number of students who show up is fewer than this many people. <laughs> There's far more. Um, I've only gotten the match once before. So thanks for having the same birthday. Um, so. One of the things we can think about, though, as we begin to put these things together is to now layer some other things on top of sort of the basics of probability, which is the notion of conditional probability, which is one of the most powerful concepts in probability. And it's the notion that what's the chance of something happening or if some event E occurs given that some other event F has already occurred. So that's kind of the highfalutin way of saying what's the chance of something happening if I've already observed something else in the world? Okay? And the way we would say that is conditioning on F. F is the events that we've already observed. And so conditioning on F means with, given some information about the world, which is the event F took place, what's the probability of something else happening? The way we write that, because you'll see me use this notation a little bit, and because the vertical bar character just never gets enough action in the rest of the world, um, is the probability of E bar F, which would be sort of stated as the probability of E given F or conditioned on F. That's basically that F has already occurred. So everything after the bar says that's already occurred in the world. Okay? And there's this theorem, thanks to Thomas Bayes, who we'll talk about momentarily, Bayes' theorem, which is just this beautiful, beautiful piece of probability that's actually a couple hundred years old. And what it says, it gives us a little formula. And I don't expect you to normal, memorize the formula. There will not be a quiz at the end. That's one of the benefits of being an alumni. <laughs> the probability of E given F is given by this little formula that we could think of if F has already occurred. What's the probability of E and F both happening given that my universe is now limited to the universe that F has happened? So I can think of that as the probability of E and F given the divided by the probability of F. The more important thing to think about, though, is that this little formula here, notice this is the probability of E given F. So F has already happened. What's the probability of E? This formula gives me a way to flip that around and turn that into what's the probability of F given E 
There are some other things I need to multiply and divide by in order to do that flip, but the critical factor is that mathematically there is a way for me to be able to flip around what was observed in the world and the thing I'm considering the probability of. And if this doesn't seem particularly interesting, now I'll show you some examples of things where we can use it for that become very interesting. Okay, but just to give you an example of how this might work, the probability of rolling a 10 on two dice given that the first die was a 5. Right, so I tell you there's these two dice. I already observed this one was a 5. Now what's the chance you rolled a 10? Well, you have to have rolled a 5 on this die as well, and there's a 1 in 6 chance of rolling a 5 on that die. And to make sure the math all works out, we can say, well, what would be the numerator here? What's the chance of rolling a 10 and a 5 on the first die? That's 1 in 36, because there's one and exactly one roll, namely rolling two 5s out of 36 possibilities. Remember, the dice are distinct. Out of 36 possibilities, that satisfies both of these criteria. So 1 out of 36 possibilities would be the numerator. The denominator would be what's the probability of rolling a 5 on the first die, which is 1 sixth. And now if I take the 1 sixth divided by 1, or 1 36 divided by 1 sixth, I get the 1 sixth. So everything, intuition and sort of the mathematical formula match. Okay? So what are we going to do with that formula? We're going to talk about Thomas Bayes. So here's Reverend Thomas Bayes. He was actually an 18th century British mathematician and Presbyterian minister. And if you have difficulty remembering what he looks like, just remember he looks remarkably similar to Charlie Sheen. Okay? That's entirely unimportant. And this is the young svelte Sheen. We won't talk about what happened to, you know, Charlie Sheen later on. All right. So what are we going to do with this? Well, one of the things we can do, this was actually something we did at Google quite a bit, is probabilistic text analysis. How do we think about that? Well, one of the ways we can think about it is ignoring the order of words, what's the probability of any given word you write in English? So first thing people see that and they say, ignoring the order of words, why would I ignore the order of words? Like, that's where all the meaning is. Trust me, I have some students that basically ignore the order of words in their writing, <laughs> okay? But if we think about what does that mean, the way you could think about that quantitatively is if you take an essay that someone has written and you cut it up into slips of paper where there's one word on each slip of paper and you put them into a bag and you shake up the bag, you put your hand in, you draw out a particular slip of paper, which is a word. What's the chance you would retrieve a particular word from that bag? Okay? And so the way you can think about this to make it more concrete is the probability of the word the is much greater than the probability of the word transatlantic for most people <laughs> writing English. If you write transatlantic more than the, there's some issue going on. I don't want to know what it is. Okay? But generally people write the word the more than transatlantic. This crowd, this has certainly got to be true. <laughs> okay? you, gotta, you just got to slip it in. <laughs> you you got to find some way of getting in there. Okay? So the probability of each word can be measured from someone's writing, right? If we see someone's writing or some set of their writing, we can basically count how many times we saw particular words divided by the total number of words they've written. That gives us some estimate of the probability of writing particular words. Now, here's the interesting thing. Remember our friend Bayes' theorem that says, what's the chance of something happening given that something has been observed? So what's the probability of these words appearing in your writing versus someone else? The probability of the word sunny, given the writer lives in California, is probably greater than if the writer lives on the East Coast. Okay? Not always true, but generally that would be the case. One of the things that we also find is true that's interesting is remember our friend Bayes' theorem that lets us flip the probability around. Which means if we estimate the probability of particular words appearing given that we know who the writer is, we can apply Bayes' theorem and flip it around so we can determine the probability of some person being the writer if we get a piece of text that has no name, no name associated with it but is just a bunch of words. Okay? And so if you think about how people de-anonymize stuff, as a matter of fact, a couple years ago, J.K. Rowling, who wrote the Harry Potter series, big fan, I have small children, decided, you know, people know me for Harry Potter. And anything I write, they're going to go buy it just because I wrote Harry Potter. Which is not a bad problem to have, but she wanted to say, what happened? What would if I wrote something that I wanted to be new and fresh, and I didn't want people to buy it because they thought it would be me? So she wrote a new book under a pseudonym, and very quickly people applied this kind of analysis and said, "Hey, that's J.K. Rowling." And she's like, "Ah!" <laughs> so once you write stuff, it's out there. My students get really disturbed when they think they're writing stuff anonymously online. We're like, "No, check this out," and they're like, oh, "I gotta go." Um, okay. 
So this has also been done in historical context, right? So if we look at the Federalist Papers, right? So if you remember back to English class, or not English class, history class at some point, or you just saw Hamilton recently, there is the notion of the Federalist Papers, which were 85 essays advocating ratification of the US Constitution. They were all written under the pseudonym Publius, which is fun to say three times fast. But who really was Publius, right? Well, we know that Publius was actually a combination of Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay, three of the founding fathers, who luckily for us had written a whole bunch of stuff that their names were attached to. So we could go and look at what they had written, do a text analysis to see what are the probabilities of their respective word usages, and then go and figure out who wrote which essays based on de-anonymizing those texts, based on what we know about the probability distributions in their known writings versus the unknown writers, the distributions. And actually, interestingly enough, it turns out there was a couple of the essays that actually looked like they were jointly written because their probability distribution for word usage is a combination of more than one of the authors. Okay? This also applies online, where we don't get things that are written as well as the Federalist Papers. Okay? We get a lot of spam. And so one of the things we can actually look at is what's the probability the word Viagra appears in an email of yours, given that you are the writer, right? versus the probability of the word Viagra, given that the email was a spammer. I would like to think that this is generally true. Okay? And in fact, it is sufficiently true that this gets used in industry in a bunch of places. So here's a little graph from Google. If there's any Gmail users in here, I won't ask you if you use Gmail. If you do, thanks. But the, what this graph basically shows is the red line is the percentage of email being sent. And this is a couple years old because I can't show you the more recent numbers because I'm not there anymore. And that would be a violation of various things. But we won't talk about that. The red line shows the percentage of all email being sent through Gmail that was spam. Right? You can see this thing's going up to 80%. These days people estimate the percentage of all email that's sent is, that spam is about 90%, depending on who you ask. The blue line is the percentage of email that gets through the system that is spam that does not get marked and filtered out by the system as spam. That percentage is going to zero. As a matter of fact, it declines as the amount of spam goes up. Why would that be? It's learning. It's learning. It's, learning. <laughs> it's brain is a neural net computer. I got to break into my Arnold Schwarzenegger accent sometimes. So what's happening is we're getting more data to be able to do that analysis to determine the probabilities. And then we can actually do a decision analytic function to decide how bad is it to filter this email out versus sending it through. And it turns out those are differential, right? In some sense, it's much worse to filter out a legitimate email than it is to allow a, uh, or, or to filter out a legitimate email than to allow a spam through. So you can actually differentially weigh those things using some techniques we'll talk about in a bit. And so one of the things Google talks about is how there is hundreds of factors that are used in classifying spam. And this actually, Many systems uh, in the world now use these kind of techniques. As a matter of fact, they were uh, uh, started at Microsoft, actually, with some former students of Ron, who I turned how, happened to be an intern with, David Ackerman and Eric Horvitz. So the reach is large. Let's talk about Let's Make a Deal. So anyone seen the TV show Let's Make a Deal? A few folks. And some people are like, really, Maron? There's, like, there's better TV on now. I know, but a tear well's in my eye for let's make a deal. There's Monty Hall. This is another one of those classic statistics problems that you could never escape a probability class without seeing this problem. So I feel like now that you're trapped here, I must not let you escape this without actually seeing this problem. Okay? So the way this is get, getting set up, and now we're going to move into actually making some decisions now that we have all this framework for probability. The game show, we have a game show with three doors. Okay? And so I couldn't install actually three game show doors in here, and it wouldn't be as interesting to use the side doors. So I'm going to have three envelopes instead. And we're just going to call these A, B, and C. Okay? So these are our three envelopes. Behind one of the doors, in this case inside one of the envelopes, is a prize. And I can mix up the envelope so it's equally likely to be in any envelope. And behind the, in the other two envelopes, there's nothing. So what I actually put in all these envelopes is a green slip of paper because in the past when I would do, the students would be like, hey, Maron, that's pretty neat. And that would make for a really bad demo. So all of them have green slips of paper. One of them has an additional green slip of paper which has a portrait of Andrew Jackson on it. Okay? So I need a volunteer. Come on down. First hand up. So by the way, have you seen this demo before? Maybe. I know the it's good. It's good. What's your name? 
Hi, nice to meet you, Dave. I'm Aaron. So what we're going to do, I could say I'm Monty, but there's probably some trademark issue with that. So you can choose any one of these doors. Go ahead and pick whichever one you like. Okay, don't open it yet. Now what we're going to do is what the host would then do is open. Yeah, see, it's a green slip of paper. The host opens one of the other two doors revealing nothing. So I'm guaranteed that I will open one of the other doors and show that nothing's in there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to check back here. You keep looking at them. Okay. Yeah, 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 that's it's the Stanford way. Um, so here's an envelope. It has the green slip of paper, and inside there is no money. Okay, so at this point I've revealed one of the doors that has nothing behind it. Now you are given the opportunity to exchange for the other envelope. Okay, so let's go through the analysis. I don't want to put you on the spot, but let's go through should we, right? So we have this decision we need to make should we do this. So first thing, if we don't switch, our probability of winning is one third. Any questions about that, right? We sort of randomly, you randomly picked one of the envelopes. One of them had the money in it. It was equally likely which one you picked for some notion of equally likely. So there's a one third chance. So now, without loss of generality, mathematician's favorite saying, right? You got to work it in somewhere. Without loss of generality, let's call the envelope you picked A, okay? And that's always going to be A. So let's consider the, the possibilities that could exist now in the world. Possibility number one is that A is the winner. There's a one third chance of that happening. Now, what would happen? If he's holding A and A is the winner, I would be holding B and C. Okay? Both B and C in this case would be empty because you're holding the winner, right? Because this is the world in which A is the winner. And so I would open one of those envelopes, show you an empty envelope. The other one would also be empty. And if you switched, you would be switching for an empty envelope, which would guarantee a loss. So if A is the winner and you initially picked A, but then you switched, if that was the given scenario, then your probability of winning is zero. Okay? But there's only a one third chance we live in that world. There was a one third chance we live in the world where B is the winner. Now, you still picked A, but this is the world in which B is the winner. So I'm holding B and C, and you have A. So if I'm holding B and C, you're holding A, I can't open that. B is the winner, so I can't open that, so I'm forced to open C. Okay, because it makes for a really stupid game if you're like, hey, B's the winner, and let me show you the winner, and now do you want to switch for an empty envelope? And you're like, no, why did I even come? I had better things to do on a <laughs> Wednesday night. So I can't open A, I can't reveal the prize in B, so I'm forced to open C, which means I'm now holding B in my hand in the situation in which B is the winner. So if B is the winner and you picked A, but then you switch, you are guaranteed to switch to B, which means your probability of winning is 1.0. By symmetry, the third case, where C is the winner and has a one-third chance of happening, has exactly the same dynamic. You're still holding A, I'm holding B and C. I can't open A because you're holding it. I can't open C in this case because C is the winner, so I'm forced to open B, which means I'm holding C that's the winner. And if you switch, you will switch to C and always win. So these are the three possibilities in the world. And if we want to consider what the probabilities of you winning, given that you picked A and then switched, we add those three worlds together because they're mutually exclusive, but we have to weigh them by their respective probability. So there's a one-third chance of zero ch probability of winning, one-third chance of probability one winning, one-third chance of probability one winning. So if you switch, there's a two-thirds chance of winning. So do you want to switch? <laughs> You're like, I wanted to switch 10 minutes ago and you made me stand up here. Go ahead and open it. Let's see. I really hope this works. Whoa. And there it is. <laughs> Thanks very much. And thank you for all the years of tuition. <laughs> all right. Well, yeah, can, <laughs> that would be, I always worry about this one because it's like, oh, I hope he wins. I, hope, I, I will tell you this story once. I did this with some high school students. And I had this student in there who reminded me of me when I was a kid. Because I used to watch uh, Monty Hall, the Let's Make a Deal. And they would go through this whole exercise, right? And I would always sit there as a kid, because I didn't understand probability, and be like, don't switch. He's trying to fool you. Don't switch. <laughs> and then, like, the kid who I was doing this demo to did exactly that. He said, no, I just feel lucky. And you know, when luck and probability collide, guess which one wins? <laughs> probability. He lost. Yeah. So let's talk about expected value. So now at this point, we've talked a little bit about probability and conditional probability. We can talk about these expected values. So again, we need to formalize a little bit. We're going to have x, which is going to be a variable. Okay? And all that is is what's the result of our experiment if we were to quantify it. 
So x could be, say, the result of a die rule. It's now going to be the numbers 1 through 6. So we could also have it be the result of a coin flip, and you say the number 1 for heads and the number 0 for tail. So it can always map into real values if we want. An expected value basically says, if we were to open up statistics book and look at expected value, what it would say is the expected value for a random variable is what you get is if you look at all the potential values that x can have, like say all the numbers you can roll on a die, and you take each one of those values and you multiply it by the respective probability of it happening and you sum over all the values. That's a highfalutin way of basically saying this is an average. Okay? But it's a weighted average. It's an average of all the values weighted by how likely each value is. And so back in the day when you took exams and there was a thing called the mean for the exam, the mean of the exam, exam was an expectation where everyone's score was just weighed equally. So the probabilities were all 1 over n where you had n students and x's were the scores. And so you added all the scores, divide by the number of students. That was the mean value or expected value for that exam. Okay? So it also has a bunch of other names, the mean, the expectation, the first moment, we could go on and on, has like seven different names from the statistics literature. Most of them are unexciting, we'll just call it the expectation. Okay? So what does this mean? Let's do a couple examples to ground sort of this formula. If we roll a six-sided die and we say x is the outcome of the roll, so it's a number, we can go through what's the probability x is 1, x is 2, x is 3, 4, 5, 6, all of them are the same. If it's a fair die, they're all 1 sixth. And so what's going to happen? is their expected value says you take each possible numeric outcome, value of the variable, and multiply it by the probability. So well, there's one sixth chance of a one, one sixth chance of a two, etc. So the expectation is seven halves or three and a half, which is weird because we can't roll a three and a half. But the way you can think about it, if I were to roll this die over and over and over again, what's the average value I roll by summing all the values together and dividing by the number of rolls? It's three and a half. We can now apply this to games, which gets slightly more interesting. So let's say I flip a fair coin, and the game is you get $5 if it's heads and $2 if it's tails. So we can ask, what's the expected value of that game? What do we expect in terms of winnings? And so what we do is we define a variable z, which is our winnings, and the expectation of z becomes our average winnings for that game. And so our average winnings for the game is the possibility of winning $5 has a 50% chance. Possibility of losing $2, so we just have negative $2, has a 50% chance. We sum those together and we get the average value of the game is $1.50. So again, I can't realize $1.50 by playing the game once, but if I played it over and over, on average, I would win about $1.50 per time I played the game, on average. Okay? So, when we begin to think about that in a decision-making process, we can take this notion and put it in a, in a graphical context, which is something called the probability tree, which models the outcome of probabilistic events with a tree, except we put the tree on its side. So these are kind of the branches coming off the root, and we have a coin flip, and then we specify a probability for each branch. So we say there's a probability p of getting heads, a probability of 1 minus p for tails, where, for example, we have an unfair coin that comes up heads with probability p. And now we can model decisions with this, using basically this idea with decisions stuck into the tree where we can say your choice now is to buy a ticket. If you choose not to buy the ticket, your outcome is zero dollars. If you choose to buy the ticket, now you're basically in the lottery and there's a probability P of say winning a million dollars if that's the payoff for the lottery, minus one, why is there minus one? You gotta pay for the ticket, right? They're not just giving them out for free. And if you buy the ticket, but you don't win, which has probability 1 minus p, then your payoff is negative $1 because you didn't win the game. Okay? So what's your expected payoff? You look at your two possible choices in that decision, and you compute the expected value. So the probability of winning times the payoff if you win, plus the probability of losing times the payoff. And then if you choose no, what's your expected payoff is just zero in that case. Okay? And so you can think of that as the dollar values associated with that game, and then you can make a decision based on how you value those dollars. That gets in the notion of utility, which is kind of this interesting concept. So utility is the value of some choice or some outcome. It's how much value you derive from it. Okay? So what do I mean by that? So let's say you have two choices, and each one has n possible consequences. We'll call them C1 through Cn. And each of those consequences will occur with some probability pi, depending on which choice you make. And so what we can do is we can say each of those consequences has some value to you. It has some utility. 
Okay? And so there's this function we'll think of as u, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, that if I get that outcome, here's the value that I perceive from that outcome. And then you could think about which choice would you make. So let's consider the example. You could buy a $1 lottery ticket that has a $1 million prize in that lottery. We'll tell you the probability of winning up front is 1 over 10 million or 1 over 10 to the 7th power. And then you can go ahead and say, if I buy the ticket, I have two outcomes, C1 and C2, to win or lose. What's the utility of winning? Well, if I just think of raw dollar values, that's a million dollars minus one. If I think of raw dollar values, it's minus one in the case where I lose. And in the case where I don't buy a ticket, there's one guaranteed outcome, and the utility in that case is just zero, because I'm guaranteed to not spend any money or win any money. So if I say, what's the expected value of buying the ticket? I do my little expected value computation, probability of winning times the payoff for winning plus the probability of losing times the payoff for losing, and it's about roughly negative 90 cents. And if I do the expectation for the don't buy decision, that's probability one, I get zero. And so now if I want to think about that notion of maximizing my expected utility, my utility is the value that I get out of those dollar amounts, which we'll talk more about in just a second, I compute the expectation over the potential outcomes of that decision, and I maximize. So I have two choices, buy or don't buy, I pick the one that has higher payoff, which in this case is don't buy. And the California Lottery, if you play, has the slogan that says, you can't win if you don't play. That is accurate. <laughs> but a more encompassing accurate description would be, you can't lose if you don't play. <laughs> that just doesn't sell as many tickets, okay? So, if we push a little further into this notion of probability, there's this concept of good decision, bad outcome, which Ron stresses a lot, and I think is one of the critical notions in, in decision analysis, which is to separate the quality of the decision-making process from the quality of the outcome. And people often convolve those two things. They think about, was the decision I made a good or a bad decision based on what happened? And the truth is, you are making the decision before something happens, so you should be able to assess the quality of that decision as being a good or bad decision prior to seeing the outcome. So let me give you two examples. Buying a lottery ticket. Some people, if you go and you interview lottery winners, I hope the person who won 700 million was a Stanford alum. But they say, you know what? I bought that lottery ticket, and that was the best decision I ever made. If that was the best decision you ever made, you got problems, because that was a horrible decision, most likely. <laughs> so even if you win the lottery, buying the ticket was likely a bad decision, okay? Let me give you another example that's a little closer to home, which is Stanford and the Loma Prieta earthquake. Anyone remember the Loma Prieta earthquake, 1989? Yeah, I was living in Robley at the time, which the year before had been closed for seismic retrofitting. And the dorm started shaking, we were just like, I believe in the power of engineering. I really hope this thing doesn't fall down. And it didn't, and we were, we were happy. Um, but Stanford incurred over $150 million in damage okay, as a result of the earthquake. Stanford chose to self-insure, which is a euphemism for not buy insurance. <laughs> but take that money that you would have paid for insurance and put it into a bank account so that someday when you need it, if there's an earthquake, you have that money there. You are essentially becoming your own insurance company. Unfortunately, Stanford decided to do this just a couple years before the earthquake happened, and there was only 3.4 million in that reserve account when there was $150 million in damage. And so someone can look at that and say, well, that must have been a horrible decision. Well, there were other factors, like the earthquake insurance cost $5 million annually. There was a $100 million deductible. And the probability of an earthquake happening that would cause that kind of damage was actually very low. So you could do the expected value computation and say, this was not a bad decision. It was just a bad outcome because the earthquake happened earlier than we expected. Okay? And that's the important thing to distinguish. right? If people want to say, oh, well, this thing happened, so that makes the decision good or bad. Uh-uh. Except you want to separate those two notions. Okay? So let's talk a little bit more about this utility thing because we're supposed to be maximizing expected utility. Utility is the value you derive from some quantity x. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, let's kind of consider some games to think about. Let's say we have this particular game. We're not going to play this actual game in here, but just as a thought experiment. You can choose, I will ask you, do you want to play or not? You can say, no, I don't want to play, in which case you are guaranteed $10,000. Someone just comes and writes you a check or gives you a bunch of cash. If you choose to play, we flip a fair coin. If the coin comes up heads, you win $20,000. If it comes up tails, you get nothing. 
Okay? How many people would choose to play the game, which is do the coin flip for 20,000? We got a couple, like three out of 350. How many people would choose not to play the game? Pretty much everyone else. Okay? But if you look at those two outcomes, you would say an expected value, they're the same. Right? The expected value of this is $10,000. The expected value of that is $10,000. So why don't we get a 50-50 split? The reason why we don't get that is because the actual value of that money to you is the utility you derive from having that level of money. Relative to a whole bunch of things like your current financial state, what you might need that money for, etc. And for most people, the utility of $20,000 is less than two times the utility of $10,000. And if that's the case, then taking this guaranteed is completely reasonable to do because that is not the same thing. It's not as high as two times the utility of $10,000. And I just put this in, in cash values, but oftentimes it includes intangibles in life, which are the really difficult thing to assess. That actually takes a bunch of time. That's the place where you want to take Ron's class and a bunch of other classes on thinking about how do I value these kinds of things and the probabilities of them happening. But thinking about quality of life, life expectancy, personal beliefs, when you're dealing with medical decisions, right? they're not about dollar values. They're clearly about things like quality of life. And that's one of the things we'll briefly talk about in a bit. So when we talk about quality of life, let's get morbid for a second, shall we? <laughs> Nothing more fun on a Wednesday night. There's a notion of a micromort, which is a one in a million chance of death. Okay? And so one of the things we can think about, morbid as it may be, is how much would you need to be paid to take the, on the risk of a micromort? Cash dollars right now. We could have this huge wheel up here, has a million slots on it, one of those little like wheel of fortune things in Vegas, and one of them has a skull and crossbones. That comes up, you're out. Okay? <laughs> Literally. <laughs> but I'll pay you cash to spin that wheel. How much would you need to get paid? Anyone spin the wheel for $20? <laughs> Couple folks? <laughs> the person who does decision analysis is like, oh yeah. Anyone spin it for a hundred, thousand, million, yeah? Anyone who's like, there is no dollar amount you can pay me to spin that wheel. Few folks, interesting. All right, well think about that. We'll get back to you in just a second. That is actually for many people different than how much you would pay to avoid a micromort. Now someone comes along and says, you are faced with this dilemma. You have to spin the wheel unless you pay me to get out of it. Psychologists tell us we will actually react to those two situations differently. Even though in some sense, in a rational sense, they're sort of the same, we're not entirely rational. So for those people who said there's no amount of money you can take, pay me to actually uh, take on this risk. You ever been on a plane? Because <laughs> your chance of dying in a plane crash is about 1 in 1.5 million. Don't want to be morbid, and you're like, no, I'm just going to drive everywhere now. <laughs> that mile for mile is even worse. You're like, all right, I'm not going to drive, I'm not going to fly. You want to walk around outside? There's a higher chance of getting killed by life. <laughs> okay? So we assume risk all the time. We just don't think about it. We like to think in terms of absolutes, but in some sense we are taking on all these risks every time we take on every activity. And once we realize that we're doing that, it gives us a little bit more context to think about how we should actually assess some of the real risks that we have a choice over in life. Okay? So it's also a nonlinear function, right? If you now think about how much would you need to be paid on to take on a decimort, which is a 1 in 10 chance of death, for many people, that is not a linear function of the amount they would need to get paid to take on a micromort. Okay? And if you think this is morbid, which I do, to be honest, I think this is morbid. This happens all the time. Right? Car manufacturers do it when they think about safety features. Insurance companies do it. What do you think life insurance is? Right? They can't be any more explicit. It says life insurance. <laughs> You're like, huh, yeah, that's not so morbid as that guy Wednesday night. It's the same thing, right? They just have certain things like the central limit theorem going for them, but we won't talk about that right now. We're like, but does that apply to me? No, because you're an individual. But that's how insurance companies will actually talk a little bit about insurance, how they make money um, by taking risk out of a system. So let's consider playing a game. 
And so the idea here is which choice would you make? And so the way we're going to set up the game is you can either choose to play the game or not play the game. If you play the game, it's a coin flip where if it comes up heads, you get $1,000. If it comes up tails, you get nothing. If you choose not to play the game, you get X dollars. But X is not determined except for you. Okay? And what I want you to think about is what is the value of X for which you are indifferent to playing? Indifferent is a difficult concept for people to really think about to be indifferent to something. So one way you can think about being indifferent is if you allowed someone else to make that choice for you, you would be happy with whatever they chose. Right? So the choice gets taken out of your hand. You're like, really, those two outcomes are equivalent to me whether or not they choose to play the game for me or not play the game for some value of x. So think in your head, what value of x is that? Right? How many people would choose to play the game, so do the coin flip for 1,000 if the otherwise guaranteed payoff was $250? Well, fair number. So most of you would actually need less than $200 to take that as the guaranteed payoff versus this game for 1,000. So if we go up to 300, 400, anyone still in at 500? Anyone in at 600? We got a couple of people in for 600. We're going to Vegas. <laughs> After this, we're going to Vegas because you, you like to gamble. <laughs> this value of X, which is entirely for you, there's no right answer. For every individual, it's different based on your situation in life, all the other factors you're considering, is what's referred to as your certain equivalent. What it says is that this choice that involves uncertainty has something that to you is equivalent that involves no uncertainty. And that's an interesting thing to think about because for all the folks who are like, yeah, 250, I'm indifferent, you are willing to give up money to avoid risk. So you can actually take the probability in the system and assign a dollar value to it in some very blunt way because we want to eliminate risk from the system. Okay? And so the certain equivalent is the value of the game to you. There's no right answer for anyone other than yourself. So in some sense, it's the, everyone gets the right answer if you really pick the right value for you. So let's pick a slightly different game. Let's say it's the game where if we flip a coin, you win $20,000 versus nothing. Or let's just say for that game, your certain equivalent is $8,000. let us just say. Okay? Well, it turns out if we think about that, the expected monetary value, the EMV of the game, Right, if you choose to play, is $10,000. It's 50% times 20,000 plus 50% times zero. So the expected monetary value of the game is $10,000. You are willing to be indifferent to that game versus $8,000, which means you are willing to give up essentially $2,000 of expected value in order to have certainty. And that's what's referred to as your risk premium. How much is the risk actually worth to you as a dollar value? Right? It's interesting to think about that probability now converts to a dollar value, okay? because you want to eliminate risk. And this, as we alluded to before, happens all the time. Right? It's how much you would pay to give up risk or to avoid risk, and it's what insurance is all about. So if we think about the choice to say insure a car or not insure a car, and I'm making this very simplified. It's much more complicated than this, and in California it's actually more simplified because you don't have a choice. You have to buy car insurance. You can choose to insure your car or not. If you choose to insure your car, let's say you pay $1,000 for your premium, and it doesn't matter if you get in an accident or not, everything's covered. So we're going to assume in this world the only accidents that happen are just car damage, no one gets hurt, and we're going to assume that this is completely comprehensive insurance, so if you get in an accident, everything's fixed, but you pay the premium. If you don't buy car insurance, there's a high probability you don't get in an accident. So there's no damage to fix, you didn't pay a premium, outcome is zero. There's a small chance you get in an accident. Again, we'll assume no humans got harmed in the making of this slide, but the cars get damaged and it's $30,000 worth of damage. Okay? So if you do the expected value computation for buying insurance, that's, you always have to pay in this case, right? You're not making a positive outcome in either case, but it's $600 minus $600 here versus minus $1,000 for insurance. Most people, if they had the choice, would still buy insurance because they just want to eliminate that uncertainty of the really bad case. Okay? And so it's not an irrational decision. It's just understanding what our tolerance is for risk and what we're willing to accept and how we trade off these other things that we can trade off, like dollars, to eliminate risk. Okay? And people are very nonlinear about that. So if you think about utility, let me give you two choices. Turns out they're somewhat different for different people. So choice number one is we can do the coin flip for $10 versus nothing. Or if you don't want to play, you just take $2 guaranteed. How many people choose to play the game, the coin flip for 
How many people take the $2 guaranteed? There's a few, but the vast majority of people take the coin flip. That's great. So I'm going to do a linear transformation of this game now, which just means I multiply everything by a constant. That constant just happens to be 10 million. <laughs> okay? So now you can take the coin flip for 100 million versus zero, or take 20 million guaranteed. How many people take the coin flip now? <laughs> We're definitely going to Vegas. <laughs> but that's not a bad choice, right? For different people, there will be different situations in which they will choose one versus the other. And the reason why most people flip their choice from saying, yeah, I take the coin flip there versus I want the guaranteed payoff here is because we value money non-linearly, right? $20 million is a life-changing event, right? You're just like, yeah, I'm done. I finally get to like buy a house in Palo Alto, <laughs> right? But you're, you're generally doing all right. And having that certainty is worth more to you than also having the 747, right? <laughs> Whereas here, you're like, yeah, you know what? It's like a couple cups of coffee. I'll go for it, right? And there's maybe some fun you also get out of the game in addition to just doing the coin flip, okay? And so there's this notion of utility curves, how we, what our appetite is for risk. And the way you can kind of think about this in a simple way is if we think about dollar values on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, some notion of utility, which actually oftentimes get measured in uh, units of utils, because they're not meaningful other than to think about relative quantities. As the dollar values go up, how much does that dollar value have value to you? That's what utility is, okay? And so people who are in risk neutral, the first $50 has this much utility, and that's the same as the next $50. They are linear, right? So for every additional $50, they value it the same as the first $50. Most people are not risk neutral. They are maybe risk neutral in sort of an early part of a curve, but most people are risk averse, which is, and you know, $50 is too small a value to you, that's fine. You can make it 50,000 if you want. That works too, or 50 million, or whatever works for you. But the second one of them is generally smaller than the first one of them. So as the dollar values get bigger, the next $50 is less than the first $50, which means the utility of $100 is less than two times the utility of $50. There are some people who are risk preferring, right? Vegas is a very fun place for those people. Not always the best outcome, but a very fun place, which is that next $50 is actually worth more to them in terms of utility than the first $50. So they are happy to take an even money bet that has a 50-50 chance of happening. So let's do a real test. And what we're going to do is the game set up is I'm going to flip a fair coin. So I'm going to assume as far as I know, this, let me get out my silver dollar. This silver dollar is fair. It even has an H on it for heads so we can make that clear as to what's heads. And we're going to flip it. And if it comes up heads, you win 50 or you win $100. And if it's tails, you win zero. And this is actually an example I just cribbed completely from Ron because I did it in his class and I thought it was so eye-opening. I got to do it for you, okay? But how do we choose the person who's going to play this game? We're going to ask, how much are you willing to pay to play this game? Okay? And so we're going to just do an English-style auction in here. If I could have given you advance notice, I would have. But like, I'll take cash. I'll take PayPal. I'll even extend credit. Okay? We're in Silicon Valley. Bitcoin, whatever you got. And you're like, yeah, but that will be worth less by the end of the night. But it's not important right now. So we're going to do a real auction, right? So why don't we start the bidding at $10? Anyone willing to pay $10 to, this, to play this game? Just raise your hand. All right, how about 20? Do I have 20? 20, we got 20. Do I have 30? Do I have 30? We got some for 30. Do I have my 40? Do we have 40? We got a few for 40. How about 50? Do we have 50? We got a couple for 50. Good. How about 55? Do we have 55? We got a 55. Anyone want to outbid 55? Do I have a 60? You got to come on down. We got a 60. Do I have a 65? We got a 65. Do I have a 70? Do I have a 70? 65. Do I have a 70? It's only $5. Come on. 70? We got a 70. Do we have a 75? 75. Come on, 75. You're like, come on, it was, you're so, you're like, come on. Yeah, 75. 80. Do I have an 80? No, you're, you really, think about it. Spend a little time. Anyone else want to jump in at 80? 
We're opening it up for 80. All right, we got 75. Going once. I could go by ones, but I'm just going to just go by fives because it's faster that way. 75 going once. 75 going twice. Last chance for 80. Last chance for 80. Sold. $75. Come on down. No, I'm glad you got cash. That's great. You can just hold on to that. For, actually, let me hold on to that for right now. <laughs> so I have some questions for you, though. This is, this is fantastic, actually. <laughs> so why were you willing to bet $75? Competition. Competition. There, there, was that the only factor? Were there some other factors that came to mind? Just like in the moment? I'm competitive. Yeah, that, that makes sense. eBay. eBay. I, I, yeah. I'm hearing you. How about the fact that you get to like come up here and now everyone gets to, no? That didn't have any value for you? What if I was like your favorite presidential candidate? <laughs> Would that have any value to then bid more? No? Not for a hundred bucks. Not for a hundred bucks. There's people who are paying like $5,000 to go to fundraisers. <laughs> But it's interesting because when you mention competition, you bring up a very important point, which is that the value of playing this game isn't just about the dollar value for the payoff. Right? There's a bunch of other things that go into it, like the fact that there's competition, the fact that you might be distinguished in a large group of people, the fact that maybe you want to participate in something that you're caught up in. Okay? And so all of those things actually come into making a decision that has value that it provides for the person who's making that decision. It's not just about dollar values. Okay? And so with that said, I, I could go on a little bit farther, and I would like to, but let's play the game. So you can flip the coin. You can actually pick heads or tails, whichever one you want to be the winner. I always win. Which one do you want, heads or tails? Uh, tails. Tails. All right, let's do this. Tails. Oh. You won it. Excellent. So what I'm going to do, actually, I, you, I'll just give you the, the Ben Franklin. Yeah, congratulations. Nicely done. Thank you. But I think that when I first saw the simulation, the thing that was most powerful for me, and I think this is one of the things Ron really wants people to think about, is when we make our decisions, there are a bunch of things that come into that decision which may or may not be conscious in making that decision, but there's lots of factors than just thinking about dollar values involved or what might explicitly be in front of us, and that takes some thinking and analysis to go a little bit deeper to think about what is the value of this to me when I think about the larger scale picture. Okay? So we're going to do another experiment. This time we, someone's already got their hand up. Or, or do you have a question? Please. Basically, if you repeat this thing many times, you make money. Pardon? If you repeat this if it's not a one-time decision, but you repeat every time you have an opportunity like this, Mm -hmm. You repeat, you do make money. Yeah, so the question is, or the point is, if you have something that you can repeat, you can make money, and that's absolutely true. If the expected value is positive, then you should play that game over and over. On average, you will actually make money. Um, there's, uh, there's an example I do in, with students in class that we won't talk about here, which is a little betting scheme that you can actually use that has a positive expected payoff. The only problem with that betting scheme is it requires you to make exponentially larger bets. And so that's why Vegas puts limits on their tables, because they also know about that kind of stuff and they don't want you to do it. But absolutely, if you have a positive expected value and it's something that you won't break your bankroll to do it, you can pump that particular uh, notion. So here's our friend Thomas Bayes. I need another volunteer. Come on down, first hand up. Thanks for coming down. What's your name? I'm Zoe. Hi, nice to meet you, Zoe. I'm Aaron. So I have two envelopes here. So let me give you the setup for the game before you pick an envelope. So now there's two instead of three. So I have two envelopes, and I will allow you to have one, but let me tell you the parameters of this game. One of the envelopes contains X dollars, the other one contains two X dollars. Okay, so you can pick whichever one you want. Then there's a green slip of paper in there, so you can't tell. I know. I can't see. All right. So 
now that you don't open it yet, now that you picked one of the envelopes, okay, you've selected an envelope, do you want to switch? <laughs> no, you're like, well, he's messing with me, it's a Wednesday night. Um, okay, that seems perfectly reasonable, you don't want to switch envelopes. Okay, so go ahead and open the envelope you have and see how much is in it. So what's in it? $20. All right, fantastic. So now, would you like to switch? <laughs> now, I don't want to put you on the spot, because this one's one of those ones that's like, we didn't do this in my statistics class. <laughs> so let me help you out, okay? So to help you decide, why don't we compute the expected value of the other envelope? Wouldn't that be useful if we knew what the expected value was in here, then we could see whether or not we should switch. So we need to formalize now. So y is going to, we're going to have variable y. It's going to be the dollar value in the envelope you selected. So that is now set at $20, okay? And so one could claim that the expected value in this other envelope is a 50% chance of being half of how much you have, plus a 50% chance of being twice what you have, right? And if we take the expectation of that, that's 5 fourths y, which means you have $20. The expected value of this envelope is $25. Do you want to switch? <laughs> But before you decide, <laughs> here is the weird thing, right? You picked that envelope. Before you opened it, you didn't want to switch, right? I could have taken that envelope and written Y on it without you opening it. And suddenly this thing becomes worth five-fourths Y, okay? But you didn't want to switch before you opened the envelope. That wouldn't make any sense. And if I wrote just a Y on your envelope, you'd be like, why are you writing a Y on my envelope, Maron? That's a little bit weird. But presumably that wouldn't have affected your decision to switch. So why did this envelope suddenly become worth more for any value that was in that envelope that was positive? Okay. So that's the question we want to think about. Because before opening the envelope, we think either one is equally good. And it doesn't make sense to switch. We open one of the envelopes, we find a dollar value, suddenly this becomes worth five-fourths of that dollar value. And it turns out it doesn't even matter what the dollar value was if we believe this computation. This is always worth 20% more. Okay? So what happened by opening the envelope? Like, I got really disturbed. That's what happened. Okay? And does it really make sense to switch? Okay? So let's think about this. So if we revisit the problem set up, right, I told you there's two envelopes. One contains x dollars and the other contains two x dollars. And you selected an envelope. We're going to call that y. So now I'm going to define z to be the amount in the other envelope. And what I tried to do is I tried to convince you of this garden path computation. It's a garden path because it's not really true. Okay? <laughs> Although it seems perfectly reasonable for people trying to make decisions. Right? If you just saw the last hour and you were like, oh, that man told me about expected value and there's the expected male value formula and I'm all about variables because I'm an engineer, and I can compute that, it would have made sense to switch. So why is this equation not right? Okay? So if we think about what's going on here, there's a mathematical reason and that actually brings up a subtlety about what a probability actually is. Okay? So before opening the envelopes, you think they were equally good, so what happened when we opened one? The problem with this computation here, it assumes that all dollar values I would have put in the envelope, all values of x, right, where I have x and 2x in the dollar values, are equally likely. Right? So no matter what value you found in your envelope, it was equally likely that there was half that amount or twice that amount in the other envelope. Well, in order for that to be true, and this is where I'm going to geek out on you a little bit, because I'm going to call back a little bit of that engineering training, there are infinitely many possible values for x for putting in the envelope. Right? Because I never told you x was bounded. So x could have been anything from like, you know, 0 0.0001 cent up to, you know, billions and trillions of dollars. It was actually infinite. It could have been anything. Okay? And the problem with that is, to be formal about it, I can't have that as a probability distribution. I can't have a probability distribution where all values from 0 to infinity are equally likely. Why? Because for them to be equally likely, they all need to have non-zero values. If they're all zero, then it's, things just break because there's no chance of any dollar amount. So we wouldn't even be playing this game. We'd be on Planet Zombo. So if they're non-zero, I have infinitely many values with non-zero probability. If I integrate from zero to infinity of a constant value, is there any constant value for which I can get one? No. 
So that distribution where everything is equally likely can't exist, which means this equation can't be true for all values of y. Okay? So if that's the case, you're like, okay, but I have a particular value of y. This is why opening the envelope makes a difference. And it's about what a probability actually means. So this is one of those places when I talk to my students, they get very disturbed because we do like math for seven weeks. And then I talk about, well, probability actually has different meanings. And they're like, but it's math. <laughs> so, well, I know, but you need to understand that how people interpret what those numbers mean have a fundamental difference. Okay? So since that implied probability distribution of x is not a true probability, doesn't sum to 1, what is our probability distribution over x? What do we believe the values in the envelope can be? So there's a school of probability called the frequentist. And the frequentist says what a probability is, it's a long run average. So what you do is you play this game infinitely often. You see what dollar values Maron puts in the envelopes when you play this game infinitely often. And you count up those fractions, and that becomes your empirical distribution. If you play this out to infinity, it becomes your true distribution. There's only one problem with that. I don't let you play infinitely often, because I don't have infinitely amount, I don't have an infinite amount of money, which is also unfortunate for me and for you. <laughs> okay? There's a notion of a different interpretation of probability called Bayesian probability. And what Bayesian probability says is the probability is not a long run average, it is a belief. What does it mean for it to be a belief? And if you have a belief, what that means is you have some prior belief about what dollar values I could have put in the envelope before you ever opened the envelope. And as a matter of fact, that means you have a prior belief about the probability of anything happening in the world based on your previous experience and how you've experienced the world and what you've seen. Someone comes along and says, what's the probability of it raining tomorrow? You could say, eh, what, 10%? They say, well, that's great. How many tomorrows have you seen? None. So how can you make that claim? Because it's a belief about what will happen tomorrow. It is not the long run average of having observed infinitely many tomorrows. And you can make claims about what I've observed September 7th on multiple different years, and so I'm going to extrapolate from that. Then you're extrapolating. Okay? And it's important to be precise about what we mean. This prior belief is a subjective probability. You pick it in your head. I don't give it to you. There's an equation you used to come up with it. Before you ever open the envelope, you had some notion of what are dollar values Maron's potentially going to put in the envelope, even if you didn't consciously think about that. And by extension, that means all probabilities become subjective. Okay? So what does that now mean? It allows us to answer questions when we have no or limited data, like what's the probability of a coin coming up heads that you've never observed that coin being flipped before, as we talked about what's the chance of rain tomorrow. What a Bayesian would say is you have this belief over the dollar values that could have been in the envelopes. Y is the value in the envelope you selected. Z is the value of the other envelope. What you do is you open your envelope and determine Y. Now you see where on your probability distribution that's in your head you actually are. And so one of the things you can also think about is observing the $20 may also give you some information where you say, wow, I expected Maron to put hundreds in the envelopes and I got 20. He's a cheapskate. Well, that lowers my probability distribution down. So you incorporate that information. But once you incorporate that information, the probabilities for half as much versus twice as much aren't necessarily 50-50 anymore. And so what you do is you look at the value you have and you compare it to Given what I believe and have updated my distribution based on what I've seen, what is my new expected value for what's in this envelope? You could believe it's 50-50, that's fine, but you couldn't believe that for all possible values. Okay? But there's no inconsistency. So opening the envelope tells you something about the distribution as well. So now with all that, you're like, just let me pick. Let me ask you one more question. <laughs> there's the issue of how you determined your prior distribution. So do you want to switch? What do you think might be in this envelope? Uh, well, considering you probably only got 20s, you might not have a 10, right? <laughs> That's possible. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's see what you got. Oh, and yeah. <laughs> Free money. I'm not going to stick two 20s in there, but you can keep that. Thank you for playing. But there is this question of how you determined your distribution. And what a Bayesian would say is it doesn't matter how you determined your prior distribution. What matters is it's your distribution. You pick it based on your experience. But the important thing is you have to have one. 
Okay? You can't come in and just say, I claim nothing about this. You could try to claim nothing about it, but you really, I mean, you could say, well, I think a whole bunch of values are equally likely. And I'd say, really, you really think a trillion dollars in there? At some point, you might say no, and you create a finite distribution. But you have to have some prior value. So let me give you an example of that. Imagine the envelope you opened had $20.01 in it instead of $20. How many people would switch? How many people would not switch? And a lot of people are like, it's getting close to 8.30, Maron. Don't make me decide. I've had enough decision making. <laughs> right? This was supposed to help you make decisions. Now you're just like, I'm just going to avoid them. Why would you? So someone said you would switch. Why would you switch? There is no half set. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. That's a wonderful answer, because the half cent was last minted in 1865. And if you had one in pretty nice condition, it'd be worth about $150. So you should still switch. <laughs> But notice what happens in that decision making, right? I never told you we couldn't have half cents in the envelope. As a matter of fact, I never told you there had to be American currency in the other envelope. I never told you that the values had to be integral values. A lot of people say, but you wouldn't put change in the envelopes because then I could shake it. I never told you that. These are all assumptions we bring to bear on the decision making process that may not even be part of the problem formulation. But it's background information we bring in, thus we think about what that is and what's the chance of it really happening. And more importantly, can I question that and figure out whether or not there's more information I can bring into the process? Then those tacit assumptions influence our decisions. Okay, so let me give you one last thing, which is just we've talked for, you know, decision making for like, what is that now, 75 minutes. So in our last five minutes, I'm gonna just ask you a simple question, which is how rational are you by giving you a choice? Okay, not about the half cent. <laughs> so choice number one, you get to choose between A and B. Choice A is a million dollars guaranteed, 100% chance. Choice B is there's an 89%, so basically we flip sort of an unfair three-sided coin. There's an 89% chance you will get a million dollars, a 1% chance you will get nothing, and a 10% chance you will get $5 million. So take a moment to decide in your head if you would choose A or B. And then we're going to have another choice. This choice is a separate problem. We have choices C and D. So C has an 89% chance of zero, an 11% chance of 1 million, or a 90% chance of zero, and a 10% chance of 5 million. So now take a moment to choose whether or not you would choose C or D. So you're going to have two choices, one for A or B, and one for C or D. Okay. So take a moment to make up your mind. Now we'll consider some possibilities. How many people chose A and C? How many people chose B and C? How many people chose, uh, what do we have left, B and D? Fair number. And how many people chose A and D? Fair number. So it's split about 50-50 between A and D and B and D. So if you chose A and D, let's see what happens. Okay. So if you chose A, that means you prefer 100% of the utility of a million dollars. That is greater to you than 89% of the utility of a million plus 1% of the utility of zero plus 10% of the utility of five million. That's what's the inequality implied by your choice. And if you chose D, you have 89% of the utility of zero plus 11% of the utility of one million was less than to you because you chose D. 90% of the utility of zero plus 10% of the utility of five million. Now I'm going to do a little bit of what's known as arithmetic which is I'm going to start with choice D and subtract the utility 89% of the utility of zero from both sides of the inequality. And so what I end up with is this little box over here. So this 89 goes away and this 90% turns into 1%. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add 89% of the utility of 1 million to both sides. And so what that now gives me is 100% of utility of a million and 89% utility of a million, 1% utility of zero, 100% or 10% of utility of five million. You look at A and D and you're like, wow, those are the same. They are, except for the fact that the inequality is different in the two boxes. <laughs> okay? Which means, dun dun dun, you are inconsistent with utility theory. <laughs> Some people would claim that means you're irrational. And this comes thanks to Maurice Allais, who was a Nobel Prize winning French economist. Okay? And the question is why? Right? We just did like an hour and a half of decision analysis, and you're like, I didn't learn anything. <laughs> and you learned a lot. Why do we do this? And the reason why, and that's for any utility, any non uh, 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 or any reasonable utility function where you sort of positively value money. So why do we do this? 
right? And psychologists actually say we will do this. This is the place where descriptive and normative separate, right? Psychologists will actually predict that this kind of behavior happens. Because when we look at choice A and B, we see a 100% chance of a million, and we say, you know what? I would have so much regret, or I would be so bummed out if I got the zero that I, I want certainty. So I'm foregoing the 1% chance of zero, even though that gives me a 10% chance of 5 million. I just don't want to risk it. Well, guess what you're doing here by choosing D? You're giving up a 1% chance to win a million dollars because you want the additional 10% chance to be for 5 million now. So it's the same thing. It's a framing problem. One choice is framed as certainty versus uncertainty. The other choice is both framed as uncertainty. And what psychologists say we overvalue is we overvalue certainty because we see that 100%. And that's where we will depart from things like a normative framework for decision making. So with that said, remember, human behavior is not always axiomatically consistent. But decision making, this kind of decision analysis, happens under uncertainty to help us make better decisions. And if we can understand the probabilities that lead to the potential outcomes and how we value them, hopefully we can lead to better decisions. And so it's important to understand how the probabilities are modeled and what should be involved. And that requires a lot of work to actually think about and taking the time to determine what derives utility for you. And remember, not all decisions are subject to rational analysis. So thanks very much for your attention.